Jess if you don't remember how to spell and or pronounce that. Um, I'm a psychologist, so my undergrad degree was in psychology, my PhD was applied psychology and human computer interaction, and so the focus of this presentation is going to be on psychology. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be talking about the disconnect between what users think, what users know, and what they actually do. Um, I'll also give um, an overview of PICO, um, which is a pr proposed solution to using passwords. And I'll talk about some of the user research that I am in, uh, in the process of conducting alongside my work colleagues um, before giving you um, a demo with the help of Max uh, right at the end. Who's gone missing? Where is Max? He's right there. Phew. Right, okay, that's fine. Uh, okay, so um, some background which you guys probably already know, but password strength depends on the password design process because we rely on humans who are responsible for creating their own passwords, which means that their passwords often aren't very secure. Um, and that's because they end up right there, they end up relying on strategies such as writing their passwords down, reusing passwords, choosing passwords that are easy to crack because they're based on dictionary words, um, they're, ba they're guessable words, so for example, or numbers, for example, number plates, names, phone numbers, things like that. And they often link to the website that they're using uh, in some way or another. Okay, so this, um, this highlights a need to focus on the human side of human computer interaction. Um, and indeed, the most effective password attacks are still the simplest, and that's precisely because they target the user instead of the computer. Um, just to clarify, am I talking loud enough? All right, okay, great. And so the most common thing I hear, um, and in fact I heard it last year when I was at, in Bergen, is that you just need to educate users. If you educate users to tell them, look, pop, this, this is why passwords need to be secure and this is how you make them secure, then, then they'll do it. Um, but in psychology, it's well known that um, just educating people isn't enough for behavior change. Um, and so before, uh, okay, so before considering with the psychology, because that's what I'd really like to get on to, um, I'll just talk about what users really do know. So obviously there's common knowledge a lot of people do know that you're not supposed to use names, you're not supposed to use dates. Um, but uh, uh, in one study, there's loads of studies, but in one study that I picked out, um, they uh, found that most people do understand the importance of security, but beyond that, only about 50% of users were able to, able to identify what the most recommended password practices were. I don't know why I'm looking at the screen, because I know it's here. <laughs> um, and uh, that the majority couldn't identify the most important uh, uh, the arguably most important strategy, which is to use a combination of um, uppercase, lowercase, um, and symbols. Um, okay. okay, so um, what users think is slightly better. So um, most would agree that you should use um, passwords that aren't too short. Um, not very many, only about 50% um, agree that you should include special characters in your passwords. Most would agree that you shouldn't use any personal information. And um, most would also um, advocate changing your passwords every six months. But this isn't in line with, with what users actually do. So if we think about length, um, only a minority of users um, use uh, long passwords. And uh, this is reflected in real, more recent data, for example, the Rocky leak, where uh, you can see that the majority of users um, had a, a password that was eight or fewer characters and only a minority had nine or more characters. Again, with special characters, it wasn't great to begin with when only 50% said that you should use special characters, but it's even worse that only 5% actually uses special characters. And again, this is reflected in the Rock Q, more recent example, um, where only 3% of users uh, had passwords that contained symbols, and only 1% extra contained uppercase. Most people just relied on digits and lowercase letters. Uh, and then, um, only about half the people in the study that I'm uh, referencing here um, avoided using um, meaningful information, which is nowhere near the 70% who said that they would or that you should avoid using meaningful information. And this sort of stuff is just is replicated over and over again in other studies, but it can range between like 40% and 80% of people um, avoiding using, uh, sorry, still using meaningful information depending on what they include in the analysis as meaningful information. Okay, so some psychology. Okay, so the lack of con consensus between what users think and what they know um, is, is something that 
can be explained with psychology, um, and in particular with the, uh, uh, there's a lot of research in psychology that shows that there actually isn't a very strong link between attitude and behaviour. And then there are other theories that try and help explain what can strengthen that link between attitude and behaviour. Um, okay. So um, just to clarify, when I talk about attitudes, I'm talking about what goes on in your head. When I talk about behavior, I'm talking about what you actually do. And uh, generally speaking, you would expect some sort of consistency between your attitudes and behavior. And so when users don't follow their own advice, that can come as a bit of a surprise. Um, okay, so uh, in psychology, uh, though it's not a surprise, because people often behave in very illogical ways. Um, and I have, um, yeah, I have a few examples of this. So, uh, usually if you get someone to fill out a survey and ask them for their opinions on cheating, most people will say, yeah, cheating's really wrong. If you ask however many people, how many of them have cheated, the uh, number is often a lot higher than the, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, a, a lot higher than you would expect based on their attitude. Obviously, um, uh, knowledge uh, of the health risks of smoking isn't enough um, to um, make someone stop quitting. And, um, thinking that you know the environment is important, you should look after the environment, is not going to predict whether or not you walk somewhere um, instead of drive somewhere. Um, and that's because um, uh, there are several things. First of all, there, there's qualities of the attitude and behavior that you need to actually consider, which I'll discuss in the next slide. Um, and there's also qualities of the person and the situation that mediate that relationship as well. Okay, so first, the, uh, the uh, strength between attitude and behavior. Um, uh, the, the, the strength of the link is dictated by whether or not attitudes are informed by personal experience. So a lot of the time when somebody's hacked, um, it doesn't really have a long-term negative consequence for them. The, the worst that's going to happen is they're going to be locked out of their account for maybe a couple of days, they can reset their password and nothing major has happened. Uh, qualities of the behavior, so a lot of the time these, these passwords are used over and over again. This is their habit. It's really difficult to get them to change something that's an ingrained habit. And um, also the attitudes relative to the behavior. So not just with passwords, but uh, attitudes tend to be quite general um, and they tend to not be very salient unless you specifically ask someone, what is your attitude on this matter? Whereas actually the annoyance of typing in a password that's very specific is very salient because you're having to do it. Okay, so obviously uh, qualities of the person are also important, such as how much the person self monitors, whether or not, for example, they're security geeks, uh, whether um, they're conscientious, whether they're agreeable, and um, very importantly, what they're actually able to do. So a lot of the time, it's all very well asking someone to pick a very secure password, if it was just the one, but if you're asking them to do 20, 25 times, 25 different passwords, that's not actually doable. Um, and uh, the qualities of the situation as well. Um, most important, usually in psychology, is the expectations of others, but also the resources that are available for you and, and other situational factors. Okay, so the impact of these other factors are um, represented in the theory of planned behavior, which is just one of many social psychological models, but this one's probably the most famous. Um, and, okay, so what is it? Okay, so rather than attitude directly affecting the, oh, I can use a pointer. So I've never used one before, right? Okay, rather than uh, the attitude directly um, affecting the behavior, um, uh, attitudes is, and behavior are mediated by intention to behave which is jointly um, impacted by subjective norm and perceived behavioral control. So subjective norm is basically what everybody else around you is doing. Attitude is whether you view the behavior positively or negatively. And perceived behavioral control can be internal things like your ability to do something and external things like whether or not you have the resources available to you to, you to do the thing that you have a positive attitude towards. So if I use the example of the gym for now, if I wanted to go to the gym and I viewed you know, getting fit and healthy positively, that wouldn't be enough to make me go to the gym, because it's an awful lot of effort for me, right? If my best friend was bugging me to go to the gym, saying, look, I've been going to the gym by myself, I could really do with a gym buddy, that might increase my likelihood, it would affect my uh, intention to behave. And if I felt like I had enough money, and it was within walking distance, these things would all jointly impact the intention to behave, which would then impact me actually going to the gym. Are there any questions at this point? I kind of feel like I'm giving a lecture. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, so, right, okay, well, apply this to passwords. So, why do you prefer yeah. to, to have questions right now? Or you can do if you want, it doesn't make a difference to me. Okay, so. Uh, Unless Pera doesn't want you to. <laughs> no, 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 ask questions, <laughs> yeah, by all means. Okay, yeah. it and will so, make it less so formal. When, when, when you, when, when you uh, provide examples, right, people like rock you, but, uh, but 
So the difference between uh, services that is valuable for users and services that is not. So maybe, do you know about any studies about uh, quality of passwords in valuable services? In variable. In services that were valuable for, you, for users, like banks, uh -huh. maybe personal email accounts. You mean different types of Oh, yeah, services. because because Rockview is a musical community. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Not. So I talk about that later on. So if I if I could ask that questions be about like the specific slide that I'm on because I don't want to move too far ahead. Okay. Um, but if if I don't cover it, if I've misunderstood your question, then by all means ask me at the end. Um, but yeah, the the different environment you would think would change people's um, password um, creation techniques. Okay, so if we um. Uh, theory of plan behavior applied to passwords. So um, the subjective norm, which was the top one there, might be user habits. So people are used to using the same passwords every day. Social norms, uh, for example, um, is it normal for you to, again, I'm looking at this one, I don't need to. Is it normal for you to, um, for example, share your passwords with your family? And time pressure, so a lot of pressure, which can be, for example, time. Um, so for a lot, of the, a lot of the time, passwords, when you're asked to create a password, it's interrupting you when you want to do something else. I want to buy that pair of boots. I want to check my email banking. I want to do something else. And you're now asking me to create a password, so I'm going to do it in the quickest amount of time possible. Uh, attitudes towards passwords, like I said, are often very general, and they're in the back of your mind. Um, and uh, a lot of the time, you don't really have a bad experience of having been hacked. Um, and then finally, abilities. For example, do you have the working memory to be able to keep all those passwords in your mind? Do you have the um, ability to actually physically type difficult passwords? Um, and what devices are you using? If you're using a mobile device, you have to switch between different keyboards. And that just makes creating the password even worse. OK. OK, so where am I? Yeah, I'm here. OK. So the, the solution isn't necessarily to enforce stricter password policies. Um, because users will almost always revert to the simplest strategies possible, and this actually results in a structure of passwords that's quite predictable and content that's quite guessable. Um, and then, so, aside, uh, where am I? Yeah. Okay, so aside from uh, revealing um, patterns, password policies are also often quite general, and they're based on common knowledge rather than scientific um, evidence. Um, they don't protect against um, the most common attacks, which are phishing, key logging, or social engineering. Um, and they're often very unrealistic and they antagonize the user. Um, and so then the user ends up fighting the people trying to protect them instead of the people that are actually trying to hack them. Um, so, um, how about an alternative solution? Uh, so, uh, rather than making users create longer and more complex passwords, uh, why don't we create a more usable system that's also secure? And that's the aim of Pico. Can I move this just in a way? Right. Um, <laughs> I, that's the aim of Pico. Um, which? Okay, so the main members of this, obviously, Frank Stiano, that's his kind of baby, is, is Pico. Here today is myself and Max, who's over there. Um, also working on the team is Graham Jenkinson and Quentin Stafford Fraser. And past members was uh, Chris Warrington, who now works for Google, and he presented at Bergen last year as well. Okay, so what is Pico? Um, Pico is a small dedicated device that you would carry with you, and um, you would, instead of typing in your username and password, you'd simply take a picture of the QR code on the screen, um, and it would log you in automatically. Um, and the main usability benefits of this are cognitive and physical, so you wouldn't have to remember 25 different passwords anymore. And it's less physically effortful um, if you're assuming that you use passwords the way that you're supposed to use them, um, it's less physically ethical. It's also got additional security benefits, including um, authentic uh, continuous authentication, it's resistant to gassing, it's resistant to phishing, it's resistant to keylogging, and it's also resistant to theft, um, because Pico locks itself when it can't detect that you're around. And it detects that you're around based on an aura of yourself you've created with other devices that you're also wearing. Um, and these are called Pico siblings. Okay, yeah, that's, oh, I don't need to. So I'm not used to a pointer. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, Pico siblings are smaller devices that you carry with you, um, and they couldn't be embedded in your clothing and accessories, so you wouldn't need to think about necessarily putting them on. Um, and you can have a collection, so you could just pick and choose what you're gonna wear today, and, and that would be fine. That's, your Pico can identify you um, with, uh, with these other devices that you carry on you. Um, 
Okay, so now I'm going to go on to uh, my current research that I'm conducting, and I have. Hang on. Yeah, I sorry. Yep. I didn't see any. You didn't build any people yet. No, not yet. I'm getting onto that. All right. <laughs> um, building the anticipation. All right. <laughs> okay, so um, what am I doing? Current research. Yeah. So I've got uh, a, a lot that's kind of happening in parallel, so rather than just go for it all and probably bore you, I'm going to pick one qualitative thing that I'm doing and one quantitative thing that I'm doing. I'm also doing some other um, desk-based research, which basically is just working with my team members. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to focus on uh, some semi-structured interviewing that I've been doing and uh, um, the creation of a reaction time study uh, as well. Okay, so what's going on here? There we go. Okay. Uh, how long has it been like that? Uh, Semi-structured semi interviews, I've been conducting these on very low fidelity prototypes. So that's what we've got at the moment. We've got an app to test the actual thing itself. And then low fidelity prototypes, because ideally we'd like people to be a standalone device um, in the future. Um, and so I've got, uh, in the semi-structured interview, I asked people to um, tell me what they thought of two um, low fidelity prototypes of Pico, and I also got them to tell me um, what types of pseudo Pico siblings that we created that they'd be willing to carry, um, and that's, that's on the right hand side there. Um, and the low fidelity prototypes of Pico were first um, just um, paper designs created by um, HCI students at the University of Cambridge which we then tried to make as similar to each other as possible, except for one or two key attributes that were different. We then made plasticine prototypes, and then from that we made polymorph prototypes that were similar in weight and size to be used in these interviews. Again, with the, Pico, uh, the pseudo Pico siblings, I just got together some makeshift items and said, these are Pico siblings, which would you be willing to carry? And then from that, um, that informed um, uh, how many more, what other types I should include, and then I created very uniform types so that they were similar in appearance uh, for the actual interview. And that was all very interesting, I got some interesting results. But um, it very much focuses on, what, on a very hypothetical situation, like it's, especially when I'm sitting there and I'm asking people, do you like Pico? They're gonna feel pressure to say, yeah, I like Pico. Um, and uh, we're actually interested also in how people would actually cope with Pico. Is it actually going to be more usable than passwords? And so to answer these questions, um, I wanted to compare uh, user perceptions with reality. Um, and I, with the Pico team, um, I was looking um, at users' perceived performance and so I could compare this with their actual performance. And to do this, we first needed to, appropriate, uh, to um, identify appropriate passwords to compare with Pico. So I wanted one easy, one moderate, and one hard, based on how easy it was uh, to remember and also how easy it was to physically type as well. Um, and uh, in, in the interest, yeah, so um, after that, then the next step is to compare people's perceptions of performance with their actual performance. Uh, so, was it, I thought I saw a hand go up or something. Did that happen? No? Okay, right, that's fine. Okay, in psychology, um, it's well known that perceiving, uh, which is a very subjective experience, is not the same as objectively knowing. Um, and that's because, um, while useful, um, uh, and indeed our perceptions are needed, uh, they're also very limited. So, um, how, what we perceive as useful for forming hypotheses, but they're not necessarily useful for determining whether or not those hypotheses are true. So, if we consider this question, are psychological concepts easier to understand than physical concepts? And I would bet that most of you in this room would say, well, obviously, physics is harder than psychology, um, except for the fact that you don't want to hurt my feelings, I assume. Uh, so, uh, I would like you to consider that your perception might not be accurate. So. Um, there was a study, uh, and there are lots of studies like it, but there was a study carried out um, that got people to rate the difficulty of different psychology questions and different physics questions, and then they got two questions that were rated equal in terms of um, difficulty, and asked another group of people to say, uh, okay, which one's more difficult, and people intuitively said the physics question was more difficult, even though it's not actually more difficult than the psychology question. And that's because we all have a superficial familiarity with psychology because we're all people. We all have minds, we all have experience of emotions, memories, decision making, and that makes us think that we know how it works just because we've experienced it. And then 
another probably better example is um, just simple optical illusions. So in this particular one, oh god, that one. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> this circle is looks smaller than this one, but they're actually exactly the same size. Okay, so um, okay, so this quote is, is like seeing is believing, but seeing is always believing correctly, and this is something that we want to tap into when it comes to. Um, looking at uh, how fast people believe passwords are relative to Pico um, compared to how, how fast users actually are with pass how fast users are actually with passwords relative to Pico. Um, because arguably what people perceive is more important than what actually happens. So if I think passwords are faster, even if Pico is faster, I'm then still going to use Pico. Sorry, passwords. Oh, tongue tied. Um, okay, so with this in mind, uh, we sought to answer the following questions, um, which is, is our perception of the time it takes to log in with different authentication schemes always accurate? Um, and is it affected by the method of login? So if, for example, Pico is more enjoyable, would the perception of time, would it be perceived to be quicker as an authentication method? Would the fact that you're physically holding up an item, taking a picture, give you more of a sense of control and make it feel like there's more time being spent or less time being spent, uh, the impact of novelty, how quickly would that wear off, and the impact of stress. So maybe actually using a new device would stress out users and it would make them feel like time is going a lot slower than it really was. Excuse me. Yeah? Excuse me. Surely, surely you've, you've, you've learned the factor of trust as well, haven't you? Pardon? The trust. If, if I have a password, I trust yeah, these, these are just examples. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, so. got, there's got to be an impact of trust as well. Yeah. Implement, implement something else mm -hmm. means I have to trust this device yeah. instead of trusting myself. Yeah, um, and uh, that's true also. And there's some evidence from the interviews that I was doing that people had um, were more willing to take on this, I this idea that they were responsible for their own authentication because of a physical device that they owned rather than password with passwords somebody else was responsible for that they, they would just you know log in and if somebody hacked it then that was the service providers problem if you ask them to carry around a physical device um, then all of a sudden the responsibility is put back on them um, and so um, a lot of people were questioning the security of Pico more than they ever questioned the security of passwords because they now have to trust this device that they're carrying around with them because the responsibility is on them to do it properly for example so they're almost passing their trust away to something else. Well, with password you are, you're, you're, you're passing your, your, your trust to the, you, you trust the service, but by asking someone to carry around a physical device, you're making them trust themselves, so which yeah, they don't want to have to do. I trust myself remembering password than a device. Yeah, but if it goes wrong, you can still blame the service. Yeah, but maybe you have to like trust the device as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't hear what you said, Max. I assume the answer was good. I was saying we have to trust the thing, the people, as well as. Okay. Fine. Sure. Okay, so now I'll take other questions while Max sets up a demo.